Sharing our stories makes us stronger and brings us closer together. So, here's to the strong women. May We Know Them, the podcast. I'm your host, Megan Lucas. I'm a coach, a published author, and a speaker. But more so, I like to create spaces for the messy parts of our stories to be celebrated and supported. Because we are stronger together. In today's episode, Sydney Dawson educates us on what happens when you allow yourself to surrender to grief and the beautiful path forward that can emerge as a result. Hello and welcome to the May We Know Them podcast. I'm your host, Megan Lucas. Thanks for being here today. Um, we record all of these episodes live. So if you're catching the recording, you missed it. Get into the live uh, recording next time, the live event, um, because this is a space where not only are we having a beautiful conversation with a guest today, Sydney, who I'll tell you about in a second, but it's a space for people who are here to contribute to the conversation, which makes for um, some fun, fun magic that we can't really prepare for, but... We're ready for it. What I ask you to do if you're catching the replay here is to have a piece of paper nearby, something to write with. If there's something that comes out of this conversation today that really lands for you, that's like validating that you're nodding your head along to, you're like, yes, thanks for saying so, write it down. If there's something that's said today that kind of rubs you the wrong way or challenges you, write it down. Trust you were meant to hear it. Um, there might be a lesson or an aha from this conversation that um, speaks to you today, two weeks from now, months from now. We don't know, but thank you for being here today in this moment, listening to this conversation. Today, we have the wonderful Sydney Dawson with us. And this is kind of a, a unique experience for me. Every guest I've had on the show so far, I've known for a while. Been through some things together, training, work, some walk of life. And um, Sydney was introduced to me um, through a mutual friend who I used to work with. And she said, hey, like, Sydney's doing something that's kind of like what you do. I feel like there's some synergy there. You guys should meet. Um, so before today, we've had a conversation one other time for about 30 minutes. And we were both nodding along the whole time. <laughs> um, and I'm so excited for you all to get to experience her today because Sydney brings such a like this warm, authentic, like we're going to talk about some hard stuff today. We're going to talk about grief and people passing and like the depths of like where that takes you and um, how it, like what you learn about yourself and all of these things that like, you just can't, you just have to kind of surrender to, even if you don't want to, like, you know, and um, man, she brings such a light to it. Um, guaranteed you're going to listen to her and you're going to smile despite what she's saying, like, even if it's something hard. So I'm really excited for you to get present to her heart and her light and her joy and her power in this conversation. Cause I got present to it in, I'm telling you like 10 minutes when I first met her and I'm like, yep, need you on the show. So with that, Sydney, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. That was such a beautiful introduction. <laughs> I'm just thrilled to be able to share this space with you. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. So the whole purpose of the show is to bring together strong women um, to get us to know who they are. May we know them. And my experience with strong women, you know, we've been through some things. It's what makes us strong. And rather than pretend like everything's fine, we take that mask off and we actually dive into some more uncommon conversations. So Sydney, like I know you're going to be sharing about a breakthrough you had inside of a hard season around like finding your purpose and like what you're doing in the world. Share with us a little bit about your story, what's gone on in your life the past few years here leading up to that breakthrough. So I guess to start it off, uh, we go back to 2020, which was an unpleasant year for many of us um, because of the pandemic and everything that brought, which I would argue includes a lot of grief, mm -hmm. but also because a month into the pandemic, so April of 2020 is when I found out that my fiance, Tyler, my boyfriend at the time had been struggling with addiction in secret. And if my world hadn't already felt 
completely upside down because of the pandemic and all the unknowns, then that certainly sent me over the edge. And that truly is when I, in hindsight, started grieving the life I thought I was going to live and, you know, what I thought it was going to look like and who I understood my fiance, Tyler, to be. Um, And the two plus years between that and when he passed away in August of 2022 was challenging alone. Um, And then since then, it's been like challenge 2.0 to figuring out what life after loss looks like for me, um, just really experiencing intense grief and all that it brings in your life and how much it changes you as a person, like fully, fundamentally. I luckily have had such significant people in my life who have really provided such amazing support and guidance through this journey. Um, who have encouraged me to like really lean into it, like feel it all. And that was one thing I immediately, almost immediately after Tyler died, felt was urgent for me was to really feel all of the grief in its entirety. And what that has done has allowed me to kind of like allow my whole life to crumble everything I knew and understood about it and myself so that I can completely rebuild it and rediscover myself and redefine who I am and what my life could look like and what's important to me. And that process has been the breakthrough. And I think it's always going to be evolving and um, it still is. And I've learned that it can be even more powerful when I can share that with other people. Another reason why I'm so grateful to have created purpose in what I've chosen to do for my work in sharing this experience and holding the hands of those who are also walking through it. Oh my gosh, where to start? Okay. (laughs) So many important um, things you've shared there. Yeah. Like the pandemic, um, absolutely a time that's called for grieving, whether it's grieving connection, grieving um, people who are no longer in our lives that we didn't get to say goodbye to in the ways like we feel like we should have been able to, um, grieving even just routines or things that we thought were once important to us that are no longer important to us, uh, whether it's work from home or relationship to what people call hard pants, like, you know, whatever it is, just new things. What I'd love to just like nuance out in, in what you shared is like, I know people have a variety of responses to grief, perhaps resistance is, is a popular one. Um, but you felt, and you said urgency, something big for you to actually lean into. So talk to us about like, what called you forth to that? What gave you the aha to lean in? Mm-hmm. versus numb out, resist, you know, you any insight there? I think I have always been someone who values feelings and feeling them. I've never really been shy of crying. You know, I've always seen value in a cathartic expression of a good cry and all of those things. So I think naturally I lean into feelings, but especially when it came to grief, I have such a vivid memory of, it was maybe 10 days to two weeks after Tyler died. And I was on a therapy session. And I just remember saying, I really just want to make sure I'm okay. And what I meant by that was, I think I had a lot of fear of what was going to happen to me if I didn't feel my feelings. I had heard kind of horror stories of things that can biologically happen, like health issues that can manifest from holding things in. And I knew pretty quickly that I did not want that to be my experience, which meant that I 
felt really strongly that I should let myself feel all the feelings and let it all out and embrace it. But having that awareness didn't bleed right away to allowing that to happen because there was there was a while of always judging myself for my feelings, you yeah. know, wishing that I didn't feel a certain way or feeling badly that I felt a certain way, um, being frustrated that I couldn't get my act together, you know, like I normally would. So there were, there were times where that I was struggling with that intention, but I do feel like right away, I set that intention that I was going to feel the the things I was going to lean into the heartache. I understood kind of intuitively before I really intellectually got the concept that the grief and the pain, like the excruciating pain was truly just another form of love. Mm -hmm. And it felt right to me to experience that as if I, if I didn't, you know, where would that love be? Like, of course I should feel this way. Um, so Yeah. And I, and I know, I know from my own experience too, that it's so uncomfortable to feel that level of pain. It makes sense that we as humans would try to protect ourselves from it and distance ourselves and busy ourselves or however, you know, we can move further from that. But I really kept a pulse on making sure I didn't do that to myself and just kind of embraced the discomfort as part of this human experience and having been able to have such deep love that now I have such deep pain. Yeah, what a beautiful, oh, I hope everyone just like really got something for themselves in that. It's, we've all experienced some kind of loss in our lives. It's actually mm-hmm. a celebration of love. You know, grief is a call for us to express that love, even if it is in a painful way. And what presence of mind on you to realize like, Hey, if I don't feel this discomfort now, it's going to affect me later, (laughs) you know? So you're wise beyond your years. Like already. Thank you. Thank you for, for mentioning that tidbit. My goodness. Uh, um, So from here, I mean, you're very much still in the process, like August, 2022, Mm -hmm. we're filming this end of October, 2023. So And I'm sure it feels like yesterday, even if it was a little over a year ago. So share with us a little bit about some of the ahas you've had along the way, where you're at now in this process. Circle it on a map for us. Right after Tyler died, I am so grateful. I was in um, a job working for an employer who was extremely understanding. Um, a lot of my colleagues had such amazing compassion and kindness and their approach to meeting me where I was. I I can't say enough good things about it Uh, because right away they were like, do not think about anything else, but yourself, you know, do what you need to do. Um, grieve how you need to grieve, but take time. And I'm so eternally grateful for that. And I know what a privilege that is. I know that not everybody has that opportunity to sit in their grief and, and be given that time to, you know, honor that experience. That's actually kind of a side note dream of mine to work on the policies of bereavement because three days of bereavement is typically the policy. You can't even get to the funeral in three days typically. So that's another soapbox for another day. <laughs> but anyway, it here, let it be known. A lot of people just nodded along and said, yep. Needs to yeah. Change. Yes, absolutely. Um, but luckily I was in a, a situation where I was given um, beyond that time that gave me the chance to really just sit in the grief and not think about anything else or worry about, you know, what was happening in the meantime or what I would have to catch up to. And not only did that allow me to, I feel, give, give the space and attention to honoring Tyler, you know, at his, at his funeral, but also just process, just sit and process what was happening 
feel all the depths of that, of that love, including the pain, like I was talking about. And so I was out of work for about three months, such a blur, honestly, to think about. And I think anyone who's lost someone would, would probably say something similar about their experience. The months following are a complete blur. But because I had this this time to myself, I was able to see friends I hadn't seen in a while or, you know, have people to my parents' house where I was staying to just comfort me and just, you know, and that be the only intention is just to glean some healing wherever I could find it. I visited friends who lived in different areas of the country and I really just tried to find joy, which was so difficult. It's so hard when everything is so excruciating and dark and it was so necessary for me. And so that's what I got in those first couple months was the lesson that joy, happiness, positivity, you know, good things in life can coexist with the absolute worst things in life. They can be held at the exact same time. It's very confusing and very disorienting when you're experiencing it. But being able to get to that nugget within those first three months was so helpful for me. And I know I wouldn't have gotten there without the understanding from work and from having that time to just exist in that place. And then I had to go back to work as we do. And that was very difficult for many reasons. Um, Not only was I trying to figure out where like geographically I wanted to be, I had been staying with my parents who live in Delaware. I was living in Maryland at the time with Tyler. So going back to work meant having to decide, am I going back to Maryland? Am I going back to the house that Tyler and I shared? Am I going to try to work remotely and live in Delaware for a while? And there were so many decisions so many. Another thing I was learning about grief is that um, like grief brain, they call it, or like a foggy brain is a real thing. And it can make decision-making extremely difficult down to like what to wear for the day or eat for breakfast. Like it just felt so hard to make any decisions. So being faced with these huge decisions, including what, where to live and what to do for my job, it was so overwhelming, (laughs) so overwhelming. But I tried because- I didn't know what else to do. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a that's a common response in grief is to try to return to some normalcy. And people will tell you too. They'll say, you know, don't make any big decisions in your first year of grief or well be careful because maybe you're just acting out of sadness right now and you might regret that later. Um and so these kinds of things were running through my brain and I was really questioning every single decision. In hindsight, what I realized was happening for me at the time was less a decision-making process and more trusting my feelings. Mm -hmm. And now I see that as my intuition. That's really what was happening at the time. I didn't have the words or the capacity to understand that, but I just had this feeling that I couldn't be in the house that Tyler and I shared. I still wasn't sure about the job, but I I knew at least temporarily that I could try to do it working remotely and staying with my parents. I knew I needed them. I needed community and support. And I wasn't, you know, I would be living alone in the house that Tyler and I shared. So I just knew I couldn't do that. It wasn't even a should I or shouldn't I? It was, I know I can't. And so I had to follow that. I did stay with my parents. I worked remotely. And luckily this was leading up to the holidays. And again, luckily my my work was just so understanding and gave me the opportunity to have like a lesser workload than I would normally. Um, and so it was like a slower season and I could just do that through the holidays and be with my family. But then the new year came and I was really struggling, like really having a hard time. One thing I had decided at the beginning of the year was that I was going to try to live by myself in, in Delaware, close to my parents. But 
in a house by myself. And I did that because I thought I should. (laughs) That was a big theme. I was doing a lot of things because I thought I should. I thought I should be strong enough. I thought that people would expect me to be able to X, Y, Z. And so I forced myself to do those things, one of which was living by myself. And it did not go well. (laughs) I struggled a lot. Um, And I want to give like visuals to struggle because I realize I say like I struggle, but then what does that mean? What does that look like? And I want, if anyone else is struggling, I want you to be able to resonate with what that means and know that you're not alone. For me, every single time I cooked or ate alone, I was crying. I was crying through it. Every time I got into bed alone, I was crying. (laughs) Every time I just sat on the couch and realized there was no one to, you know, react to the TV, whatever was, whatever I was watching, I was crying. It just was, everything was so hard and so heavy. If I wasn't crying at that time, I was kind of numb. It was miserable. It was a really hard time. And I know like January and February, at least where we live in the on the East coast, Northeast area, like it's cold and it's dark and it's just kind of a depressing time of year. (laughs) That was on top of like all of these other things I was experiencing. Fortunately, unfortunately, something happened that kind of knocked all of that loose, which was a car accident. (laughs) I say fortunately, unfortunately, because no one was seriously injured. Thank the Lord. But my car that I had recently purchased was, and for whatever reason, that experience, the car accident literally was like the tipping point for me where I realized how not okay I was. It was, I think, the darkest time I experienced, honestly, since since before I even knew Tyler was struggling, which there had been serious dark times, but that was a point I just, I didn't really see the point in doing it all, you know, anymore. Um, and I know that sounds really dark and it is, I, I want to be transparent. I couldn't find any hope. I was like, all of this is way too hard. I don't see it getting any easier. What's the point? And that is really when that, that was like the precipice of this breakthrough. And I decided to take another leave from work and really take a hard look at my life and decide what was important to me, like what I could find in it that was worth doing it all. And I had uh, a therapist who I still see now who also was a life coach. And she started asking me questions at this time that brought on some serious aha moments. Questions like, you know, I was saying, I just don't know if I can go back to work. It's so hard and I can't keep up with all the things I used to do. And, you know, I'm not the overachiever I used to be. I just don't have the capacity for that anymore. And she's like, okay, so what if you didn't do it anymore? And I'm like, but I have to do it. <laughs> I have to do it. I I have, to, you know, I have to meet these expectations. I have to, I mean, from a realistic standpoint, I have to make money and pay my bills. I have to go back to normal. You know, I, I should be able to do all of these things. And as I was saying these things, I'm realizing uh, most of them were all, were just all of these expectations, <laughs> just so many expectations that I didn't even realize I was basing my entire life around, most of which weren't even that important to me. <laughs> so I started going down this kind of rabbit hole of all of these really deep questions, like what was important to me? What if I didn't have to live my life based on these expectations? And what if I was just kind of gentler with myself and didn't feel the need to be such an overachiever. But if I could 
live every day, every part of every day moving forward based on what I feel is most important. It led me to this beautiful place of realizing that I was ready to search for safety again. I had been searching for safety in this time of like fight or flight mode, survival mode. And I'd been searching for it everywhere else except within myself. Mm -hmm. I was ready to figure out what making myself feel safe would be, which was this really intense, powerful process of trusting myself again, and then following whatever that was telling me. There's such a, um, like a fight between logistically up here in our brains, um, the shoulds, the expectations, Mm. this is what this, like, it's probably been long enough. I should get myself together, you know, and it's all, it's all a head conversation. Yeah. And I can hear like through your journey here where your heart was saying, Hey, Hey, listen to me. Hey, I have the answer here. Like (laughs) the shoulds are out there. That's not, you didn't write that, you know, and actually looking here and, um, here in your heart, I'm like pointing for people who are listening to actually integrate both. It's such a, to go back to normal, like that exists, you know? And like everyone who just went through the pandemic too, like normal doesn't exist anymore. And when you're, when something like this happens in your life and you leaned into it hard, like just like shattered, broken, like let me fall apart completely. The pieces actually don't go back together the same. Exactly. So. And it doesn't mean that anything is wrong with you. It doesn't mean like if you don't have the capacity to do things that you used to do, that doesn't mean you're less than, or mm. you're, you know, it just means you're different. Yes. So you're different. But to go through the, the, the feeling of the feelings, the fighting with the head and the heart, and then the judgment, because you're not somewhere where you think you should be like, there's so many layers to that process there's so much energy spent Mm -hmm. um and those questions like yeah are overwhelming like what like how do I want to live my life what's you know what do I want to put out into the world um I think part of the reason they're overwhelming is because we wait a very long time to actually ask ourselves that I know for me and in my journey just walking into adult life my answer to that when I graduated college was a should. It's what mm-hmm. successful people do. It's what yes. the parents expected me. Maybe they haven't actually said that to me, but it's what I've uh, interpreted. Mm-hmm. And it actually wasn't my answer. It was just what I felt like was the right answer at time. And um, I think we all go through something at some point in the years following where we have the opportunity to question that. Mm-hmm. We've gone through what's hellish. Um, and it was a, an opportunity for you to look in the mirror and say, hey, what do I want? Yeah. Man, so what'd you come up with? I want to hear your answers. <laughs> a big aha. And what you just mentioned was exactly my experience. Is just I'd always been doing what I thought I should do. I mean, my whole life, that's that's. I don't know. That's just what I thought we did. So I, you know, when I graduated from college, I, well, first of all, even before that, I went to college because that's what you do. You should go to college in my environment, in my experience. That's what I saw you should do. And once you graduate from college, you should get a job, a good job. You should work in that job, whether it's, you know, enjoyable or not. Um, Maybe get a vacation in a year or so save for retirement and then retire from that job and then do all the things that you have wanted to do. Like that was the trajectory in in my worldview that I should be doing. And so when grief and loss and all these things shook all of that loose, then I was like, but what are the, what even are the alternatives? Like, what do I do instead? And if I did something else, you know, what would the focus be? What would I care about? I was 
going through all of these questions in this life coaching process and realizing that this process was helping me find hope where I truly wasn't sure if I'd ever find it again. Like it was lighting me up in a way that I hadn't felt in a long time and wasn't sure that I would be able to feel. And part of it also kind of reminded me of part of my what I consider my identity, which is a cheerleader at heart. I was a cheerleader in college and it it really did always fill me with joy and the sense of purpose to be cheering people on. And so as I was going through this life coaching process, I was seeing how I was kind of being cheered on along the way. And every time I answered a question honestly and really like got to the heart of things, my therapist who was doing this life coaching process was like, see, there she is. You know, and I just, it it brought me, it moved me so deeply that I was like, hmm, let me look into this. <laughs> and it's interesting because my mom had been mentioning life coaching for like months, like a couple months after Tyler died, she just mentioned like, hmm, have you ever thought about life coaching? And I was, I don't, I don't think I really had the capacity to think about that at the time, but n- now in hindsight, it's like, hmm, maybe that's a mother's intuition, call it what you will. But sh- she kind of had been encouraging me the whole time. Then, you know, as divine intervention would have it, um, I, we had dinner with a family friend who had just completed a life coaching certification program and was talking about it. And I was kind of sharing my experience with it. And she's like, you should, you should just look into it, you know, see what it's all about. And I decided almost immediately that I would, and I signed up for the certification program kind of in the space of like, we'll just see what happens, but I don't want to invest so much just in case it's not for me. Um, But I found a program that was, you know, that met me where I was and I was immediately obsessed. (laughs) Like I was so inspired and to the point where I was pouring myself into these textbooks like who 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 is obsessed with the textbook? Anyone? <laughs> Have you ever not been able to put a textbook down? But that truly was my experience. And it was so inspiring that I was like, how could I do anything else? And the whole the whole process, especially in the the training I did, which was, you know, this whole person approach, really taking a look at your life as a whole, what's working, what's not, reevaluating, rediscovering, all of those things. Um, I just saw so much value in it for me, um, like healing that I could find for myself, but also to share that with other people and watch other people have these aha moments and help other people find hope when they can't find it. Like that the connection of that was everything to me. And I was just like, okay, I think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to do this. And then of course there was this whole flood of self-doubt and like, what the heck does that even mean? And can I do this? And let's be realistic. You know, will this pay the bills? All of those questions were really loud, but the, inspiration and my intuition were way louder. And that was a beautiful thing because that's what allowed me to really go for it and start this business. And it doesn't even really feel like I feel weird when I say business because it doesn't feel like that. (laughs) It feels like a life calling. It feels like what I'm meant to do here on earth to be able to dedicate my life and honor Tyler and everything he gave me and he continues to give me in this life by pursuing this calling. I mean, it's the greatest gift. I call it chef's kiss. It's just chef's kiss. Like it's so, it's so totally. 
so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I see it as such an extension of you. Like, like you said, like being a cheerleader, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. actually did that in college, but you know, I love, oh my gosh. I love that the women I bring on the show are like, there's zero gatekeeping. Mm. Mm -hmm. I've been through this hard thing. This is what I've learned. Let me share it with you. Oh my goodness. Like, why aren't we all leaning in and doing this kind of stuff? So thank you for, for choosing to follow that. It, it, it really, it just feels like a natural extension. Mm -hmm. of of who you are for sure and that means a lot to hear because it's all you know authenticity is one of my top core values and for that to be received yeah means a lot let anyone who has stickiness ickiness around life coaching know you want someone in your corner who is in the work like Mm. a life coach is not somebody who has the perfect life and is giving you expert advice you actually want somebody who's like going through some shit and picking themselves up and committed to doing that because you can do that too. Yes. Um, it's such a, and that's the messy, authentic, like that's actually what you want to see. Um, yes. Oh my gosh. That really resonates because for me too, I have been in different grief support environments Mm -hmm. and I have experienced like seeing a grief therapist quote unquote therapist who specializes in grief and that experience versus being in rooms in conversations with people who have been through something similar are completely different experiences because when someone has a lived experience and something, a shared understanding, there's so many less walls. There aren't the barriers to un- to feeling understood that there are when you have to explain something <laughs> to mm-hmm. someone else. So like when I was seeing a, a therapist who specialized in grief, but e- either didn't have her own experience with intense grief or didn't share it with me, even if she did, I felt like I had to give these explanations and justify and offer disclaimers and all of those things. And in situations where you can work with someone who has that lived experience, who has that shared understanding, you don't have to do all of that. And so it takes so much of the prep kind of like all of those building up conversations out of it. And you can just go right to the meat of things Mm -hmm. because you both get it. And that's, really what I hope to be able to share with anyone I'm able to work with is you you don't have to explain yourself to me. There's absolutely no judgment. And there is much more understanding than there might be with someone who hasn't gone through a, an intense loss in their life. So that that piece is really important to me. And I think it's essential to the work of a coach too. It's, it's, it's the difference that you can get between that and someone who who doesn't really get it. We have some guests here who are on live and I wanna give them the opportunity to hop into this conversation. If there's something you've heard that stood out to you or just something you wanna comment on, feel free to, to unmute yourselves and just jump in. This is Patty Dawson, um, Sydney's mother. Uh, I'd like to offer a couple of thoughts. This. Uh, podcast is really designed to identify the pain and the purpose that can come out of it. And so in keeping with that, I had jotted a couple of notes down as you had suggested that we might do either questions or insights that we thought would be helpful to others uh, in this conversation. And before Sydney even touched on them, the two things that I think as somebody to support someone else who is grieving? And and what are the things that you do? What's the right thing you do? What's the wrong thing that you can do that's not going to aid in the purpose? But Sydney had touched on a few of them, and I, I think they're worth highlighting for anybody who's listening to this, who is their purpose is to support somebody else who's going through grief. And one thing, one thing that Sydney touched on, I think a major piece of advice that you hear everyone say is, don't make any major changes for a year. And I had found myself even saying that to people prior to going through this experience and this journey with Sydney. And I just want to reiterate that 
you aren't the same when you go through an experience like this. Um, things have changed. So trying to be in that same pace, place, same space, and trying to move forward with your life the same way, it, it just might not work. That might be good advice for somebody who's in a much different place, but certainly somebody who's young and had, think that they have their life ahead of them shaped in a particular way, it's not going to look that way. And so allowing people the grace of making that decision for themselves, if they do want to make that change, I think is advice that I would offer to others now differently after having lived through the experience. Mm -hmm. um, and this, the second lesson that I, I got out of um, going through this experience is recognizing the burden that we place on the person who's going through the grieving. When we allow them to move through it with the idea that they have a need to appear normal to other people, mainly so that we don't feel the discomfort. And that's really not fair. It's not helpful. It's um, it's just wrong on so many levels. And so, I mean, I think those are the two key lessons that I've gotten out of this journey that I think is important to share with other people. And hopefully, um, Brian, Sid's dad, and myself have been able to grow with her through the experience by living through those two same pieces of advice that I, I just mentioned. And I don't know if Sid has any other thoughts that she would like to share about um, just quick things that either people have done right that's helpful or things that, you know, it's, you know, the old wives tale, traditional wisdom, but it's like, yeah, maybe you really need to rethink that. So thank you again for letting us share and be a part of this. So I'm going to kick it back over. Thanks so much. Preach, Patty. That's all I was mm. thinking about saying all that. Yes, absolutely. Snaps. But I, especially the piece around, you know, how people respond really it not just grief but anything where like it's it's actually from their discomfort sometimes like if they're trying to hurry it along mm. i've had conversations there's one friend in particular like going through something where sometimes she gets feedback from other friends that are like can we be done with this already like why are we still talking about this but it's actually their stuff mm -hmm. Ooh, yeah like let people have their process mm. exactly I'm kind of blown away over here mom that was <laughs> That was deep. And first of all, I have to give a shout out where credit is due to my parents because I could, I'm could. i going to get emotional talking about it, but they have been the reason I have survived, truly. Um, like my mom has held me in moments that I wish on no one. And... They, they really, I mean, kept me alive. Like those first couple weeks and months, I was completely unable to take care of myself or anything around me and they kept me alive. And I am so forever grateful. And like my mom said, they have been growing in grief right alongside of me, learning the lessons with me, listening to I mean, we've had such deep family conversations around the dinner table about how I'm changing and how, honestly, a lot of the expectations I'm trying to release were intentionally or unintentionally set by them, like in our home. I'm an only child. It was just the three of us. A lot of what I knew and thought was normal and thought was expected of me came from what I was witnessing in, you know, their, their own lives and their choices. And so we've had really intense conversations about how maybe there's a different way for me and their support has meant the world to me and their understanding. I mean, I, 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 as my own brain is shifting and so much of my focus is changing they are right there with me and that means everything that means everything to me oh to have that support um it's 
it's big in grief. So that's first of all. (laughs) Second of all, what my mom shared is so important. And I never really thought about what she said in, you know, when you, when people say, don't make any big decisions, don't change anything. And it's like, literally everything has changed. What do you mean? (laughs) What do you mean? Don't make any changes. (laughs) I mean, you have to, you have to change it. Grief and loss, and especially partner loss, when it means everything about your daily life has changed, it means that you are also changing. And to allow yourself to embrace what that looks like is the whole, it's the whole part of, of grief and growth. It's the absolute necessity in it. And I, I never realized how dismissive, I guess, those well-meaning encouragement. People mean well when they say, don't make any big decisions or don't do this. or don't. They mean well, but that is dismissive of how much is already changing and all the things that you might be experiencing that you want to change, you know, that kind of like shuts it down. So that's a huge point is let's, let's let everyone's grief be what it is. Can you meet people where they are as opposed to putting your own expectations on them? And then especially in the not wanting to be uncomfortable to like get all the, the griefy stuff on you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, it is so powerful to just stand in someone's grief and just witness it and not want to fix it, not feel the need to change it. Just be with someone. That is the most supportive thing you can do when someone is grieving. And I actually have started this series on Instagram and TikTok where I'm sharing what not to say to grievers and what to say instead. And so, you know, I won't, I won't take up all of our time here, but if you are interested in some of those things I've experienced where people say not helpful things, even when they're meeting well, um, there's a whole, there's two videos out already and there will be more because there are a lot of things that people say that are not helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are ways Exactly. Well, yeah. So like, of course, goes to listen to that. like it's no shame on, on, I'm going to say you, but us, like we actually do mean, well, it's just like a different perspective. Yes. Yes. And there are ways to reframe what you really mean. Like mm-hmm. I know people, I know what people, you know, I've, I've gotten an understanding of what people really mean, what's underneath of the scripts in supporting someone who's grieving. Um, So that's what I'm really trying to bring uh, awareness around. And the big piece of it is just to let grief be witnessed. It's not something to be fixed. It's not a problem to handle. It is just part of our human experience. And the more we're able to embrace it and feel comfortable sharing it and just letting it be witnessed, the more healing we can experience from it all. So what a beautiful world that would be, huh? Absolutely. Yeah, because whenever you have the space to just be and to experience it, then, I mean, you kind of speed up the process, I think, because you're actually allowing yourself to feel it all more fully without, like we mentioned the different layers, without the interpretation of like someone's response to us, making us take it as, oh, I'm misunderstood. Something's wrong with me. I should be at a different point by now. This is the wrong way to do this. Why do I still feel like the list of chatter? So to just hold space and being allowed to be how you are for as long as you are with whomever you're with is Mm. such a gift. Like nothing you need to do, change, be, than just you in that moment. Yeah. That's it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, as we're, we've been chatting for a while here and it feels like 10 minutes to me and I know it's been longer than that. Um, but what I'd, I'd love for you to share with us, Sydney, as we're kind of wrapping up the show here, is share with us the kind of big picture, your life coaching practice, like how it honors Tyler. I, I think it's so clever and beautiful. Like talk to us a little bit about that. And then we'll link everywhere, like where people can find you to continue to follow this journey 
you're on to support you and also like learn something for ourselves along the way. So what has been birthed from this journey uh, is, is a life coaching practice called Shift Life Coaching. And the name is really honoring how we shift in life. And for so many reasons, um, not just, you know, the, the biggest, most intense shifts like death, but there is loss in so many things. And we evolve as humans, we make shifts. And so that's really what um, I'm trying to embrace and highlight with, with my business. And I have, I launched my business with a signature one-on-one signature program that is all about transformation. And I, the branding of it is kind of around shifting, shifting gears, but it's also, I use the analogy of a car to explain the transformational process because of that branding. And also because Tyler was a mechanic and he loved cars. He loved everything about them, knew everything about them from the time he was a toddler and it was just his passion. And so it's meaningful for me to incorporate that into what has now become my passion and my purpose. And it's just kind of a a succinct way to describe the different steps that I think is helpful to digest as opposed to just this like vague transformation. Mm -hmm. So what we walk through in this process is what I call starting in park, which means what it sounds like sitting still, evaluating all the parts of yourself and your life that are working and, and are not. And it's, it sounds simple. I know it does, but how often are we really giving ourselves the opportunity to sit in those thoughts? I don't think very often life gets very busy, schedules get very full. And sometimes we can just be going through the motions without realizing what is what we want and what's not. And sitting um, and scrolling on your phone is not being with your thoughts. Like multi Amen. Not being with your thoughts. <laughs> Amen. So this is a really intentional space to dig into all of those things and rediscover who you are, who you want to be, what's important to you, and how you can build your life around that. And so after that phase, we shift into neutral, which is a phase of coasting. It's it's figuring out what you're ready to release actually going through this process of releasing it, kind of sharpening that that mindset muscle of knowing what is important to you and like really focusing on that Mm -hmm. and visualizing what you really want your life to look like in an ideal world. And I know some people are like, that's so whimsical, but you can learn a lot about yourself and your passions and things that are important to you. If you just let yourself dream for a second. Mm -hmm. So that's an important part of the process. And then once you have that clarity, you shift into the last phase, which I call drive, which is where you put, you know, the, the pedal to the metal, you put some power behind that purpose. Um, You set boundaries and use affirmations, lots of practices to help sustain this new life that you're building for yourself. And also um, manifestation and gratitude practices, things that help you continue to to hone in on what you want your life to be and what you want your future to look like. And the hope is that at the end of this process, you know, it's really just the beginning, but that you remember the biggest principle, which is that you are always in the driver's seat of your life. You get to decide what your life looks like. You know what is best for you better than anyone else. And the more you can tap into that, listen to yourself and disregard what the world wants or expects of you, the more fulfilled you will be when you manifest and create all of those things for yourself. And it really is such a beautiful process um, to experience yourself and to, to witness in other people. And I feel so grateful to be able to walk people through that as a kind of compliment to that work. 
I've also recently gotten um, certified as a grief coach specifically. And my intention with that is knowing that there is a whole phase of grieving that happens before you're ready for this shift. Um, And that is just like a lot of what we talked about, sitting in those feelings, understanding how to embrace them, integrating them into your life before you are ready to rediscover, redefine, rebuild. Um, And so I'm now offering one-on-one grief coaching sessions that can help you kind of sit through that processing stage. Um, But my hope is that after that, you can shift into this transformation um, where there's such beauty and hope and purpose and meaning in life after loss if you allow it. What an offering. What an offering. I'm thinking in particular, like, so, you know, people who listen to this podcast are my people. So, you know, high achievers who function with a lot of shoulds look outside for like, what's the right thing to do? So I don't have to sit and be mm-hmm. still. <laughs> But I have a, I have a to-do list. Like <laughs> how rude. Don't tell me to be still, you know? And yes, yes. Yeah. Like, the actual answers are they're in here. They're not in the next person development book you go by or the mm-hmm. next planner. Like they're actually within. And it's super confronting because if you're in the driver's seat, that means you have to own the wrong turns mm. steps, or like the fender benders. Like they're actually all of ours too. Um, I would much rather point fingers and blame everyone else, but then I still like nothing changes over here and I'm mad about it. So like, let's actually like own all of it. So yeah, it's confronting as it's meant to be Mm -hmm. because it connects us all to just how powerfully awesome we are. Amen to that. Yeah. Sydney, thank you so much. This is just the first of collaborations because I'm so excited. Like, oh my gosh, like, I feel like I just had three cups of coffee and (laughs) It's just so great. I um, love it. Oh. Link everything, like any resources you've shared, like link to your website where people can find you. Definitely this series on like what not to say to someone who's grieving. Go and go learn something and forgive yourself. Give yourself compassion and lean in, learn some more. Yeah. Thank you for being here for our guests that, that are here today. Um, Patty and Brian, I just want to thank you as somebody who like works with people who are around like our age sitting, like who are going through this work and then are having hard conversations with their parents where they're actually like owning like, Hey, some of like what I'm undoing here is a result of like parenting and to be able to hear that Mm -hmm. and not take it as judgment or take it personally and lean in more is like so beautiful. So beautiful. Cause I, like, I know like clients of mine aren't having that experience. Mm -hmm. So to go through something transformative and then to be met with, how dare you? Like, it's just, you know, another layer. So thank you for who you're being and the model of that. Like what a lighthouse for people. That's such like, that warms my heart too. Um, I couldn't end without saying that. That's so, so beautiful. Bravo. Not to be cliche, but it truly is our pleasure because Sydney is a pleasure. <laughs> you can be cliche. Lives. Nothing wrong with that. It's, it's the truth. <laughs> it's totally the truth. Oh my goodness. Well, to all of our listeners here, um, thank you for being here. If there was something that jumped out at you, if there's something that jumps out at you later, whatever later means to you, please share it in a comment, put it somewhere. Let's keep this conversation going. Like that's transformation. It's just, I mean, it continues to evolve. It's, this is not, this doesn't happen once and then it's over. So I um, appreciate everyone for your energy, your vulnerability, your just leaning in. Um, it's what makes this thing so, so awesome. And uh, yeah, please stay tuned for another episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. This was amazing. I'm grateful to share the space and for the opportunity to just talk about it. Yeah, we'll keep talking for sure. 